a conversation with a trailblazer. Two-time U.S. Olympian and Paralympian Marla Runyon is the driving force behind the BAA's para-athlete program. This year was special because 2020 was to be the very first time that para-athletes in the Boston Marathon were to receive prize money and awards, a change that Runyon says sends a very powerful message. Getting to 2020 was such a huge milestone for our program. When I joined the BAA back in 2017, um, and I and I was learning, you know, learning about where the program, how it was originated, and where we were at that point in time. Um, it just it just started coming to me that um, we have we need to incorporate a competitive division for our para athletes, our ambulatory para athletes, both in the United States and around the world. And we have a pro we had a program. Um, but it was really more participatory, and we have athletes that are so good and so fast who are uh, either Paralympic hopefuls or Paralympians themselves, and they come and they were coming to Boston, and no one knew they were in the race. And it's like this, this, we, this is where I felt like we could really shine in Boston. Like I said, a huge milestone for us. Uh, for me personally, and having the opportunity to bring this forward to the BAA. So very, very exciting. And I'm most important, I'm just excited to see the athletes run. That's that's what I, that's the reward in itself is watching the athletes get out there and compete and show the world what they can do. Well, talk about good and fast. You came in fifth in the Boston Marathon in 2003. You still hold the record uh, for a visually impaired athlete. You're an Olympian, you're a Paralympian. <laughs> How does this new classification, this new recognition, um, fulfill a vision that you've had for a long time and, and the benefit uh, to all para-athletes in making this happen? First and foremost, athletes who happen to have an impairment want you to see them as athletes first. And so the reframing of our program that was formerly called Athletes with Disabilities and now just known as our para-athletics divisions and programs, is all about bringing ability and athleticism to the forefront. We moved away from what was formerly known as that AWD language and, and, and now have pivoted to an, a language and a framework that is all about athletic ability and what you can do, not what you can't do. Well, talking about a pivot, I mean, we've all since March had to pivot and change. First, the marathon was postponed, then it became a virtual race. Let's talk about the para-athletes. How many will be running? Um, yeah. and, and what kind of communication have you received from them? Like, what are some of the inherent uh, challenges in trying to keep in touch with everybody? We have 150 para-athletes participating throughout our programs and divisions. Um, it includes some very uh, recognizable folks, such as Daniel Romanchuk, our 2019 uh, wheelchair division champion. Um, and on the para-division side, we have athletes such as Brian Reynolds, who is the world record holder in the half marathon as an amputee. Um, we had... Um, Jackie Hunt uh, Brosmer, who is an ultra marathoner, she ran 100 miles most recently on a treadmill. Um, she's also blown an amputee. So she was one of our featured athletes. And Chaz Davis, who is the American record holder, um, he's a visually impaired athlete, has run 230. And then some of the challenges and, and just, you know, we've, we've had, as you said, we've pivoted um, in so many ways. We've all had to do that and adapt is, um, I needed. I recognize that a lot of our athletes may have need, may need a little more support um, in their virtual run because we don't have the on course support that we do here have in Boston. And athletes are running in their neighborhoods and giving them a little more support on course as they need. Um, also allowing um, for all participants have the option to run on a treadmill if they feel that's safer for them. So on wheelchair, for wheelchair athletes, we gave them the option to um, complete their 26.2 on rollers, which is similar to like a treadmill for wheelchair athletes. So we wanted to create, um, give them that flexibility to ensure that they had the most positive and safest experience in the virtual run. 2020 Boston Marathon was supposed to be the qualifying Olympic marathon for the Paralympians. Now that we don't have that race as we knew it, what happens to the qualifying race? What, what are these athletes planning for now? 
Yeah, so we're still uh, working with the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee. They decide, you know, they, they, they decide the selection process for their team, of course. And um, they're still working that out uh, for the 20, for 2021. And so we're still in that, in that stage of just communicating with them. Um, we're certainly receptive and open to hosting if the timing works out. Um, it depends on when they need to have their team selected by and so forth and all those other variables. But right now it's a, it's a to be determined uh, moment. What advice would you give the para-athletes who are going to be racing this virtual experience and taking part in Boston, wherever they may live? I think my advice really is just for all participants of the Boston Marathon virtual experience is just have fun, you know, really enjoy the, the it's, it's a one-of-a-kind experience. You know, it's, it's the type of moment where you're going to hopefully remember the rest of your life and be able to tell your kids about and tell your family about and um but i think also always keeping in the back of your mind that sort of that vision of the future and to me right now and working at the baa i keep that vision in my mind as well and that's the vision of us all coming back to boston and we don't know right now um, of course there's a lot of uncertainty but i still feel that that's what keeps me going is thinking thinking about the future and bringing us all back together and what an amazing celebration that will be for us